What's up, guys? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Niners News here on 49ers Hive. My name is Zach Hernandez, and as always, I am joined by my co-host, Matt Llewellyn. And today, we're going to be talking about who is at fault for the 49ers' bad offensive output Sunday against the Cardinals. Matt, it was ugly. There was all sorts of ugly out there. Who would you say is most at fault for that? Well, first things first, the loss means that it's Black Hat Monday. So uh, until the 49ers get a win, the Black Hat is all you're going to see. Um, you know, there's plenty of blame to pass around. I don't think anybody had a spectacular day. I mean, even, you know, Raheem Mostert, even though he had that long touchdown catch, rushing the ball, 15 carries, 56 yards, not his best output. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with the play calling. And that's really where my blame lies for the most part is Kyle Shanahan. Um, Shanahan has the reputation for being able to scheme anything open. You know, that's the criticism that Jimmy got last year, even when he did good, was just like, oh, well, Shanahan can scheme wide receivers open. He can scheme guys open, you know. And so for me, primarily, number one, it's going to be on Kyle Shanahan because what started off as creative play calling, you know, the, the angle route to Mostert, there was a tight end sweep to George Kittle, um, really fell into a pattern of of really odd play calling. You know, there was a third and two where they they ran a wheel route. Like, you, you know, uh, th- there was the fourth and goal play where they just ran a dive up the middle, and it was continuously this frustrating thing of, like, they're not going to do that, are they? Oh, they just did that. It, why? Why are you doing that? So, you know, to me, it was, you know, I mean, the out route to Trent Taylor, I mean, why are you running stuff to the outside when Jimmy's bread and butter is definitely over the middle? So um, I, I think Kyle Shanahan first and foremost. And then secondly, you know, I think Jimmy Garoppolo didn't do a great job. And I, I'm not going to hammer him as hard as 49ers Twitter is doing. Um, they're they're going absolutely crazy on him, pretending like he's the second coming of like, you know, I don't. I, I can't even tell you. Like Sam Darnold's ugly step twin brother, you know. It, they just act like he's this garbage QB, and that's not the case. I mean, it wasn't his best game by any stretch of the imagination. He was a little bit jumpy. He had happy feet. wasn't really placing the ball well, but he did have some good throws. So, um, yeah. Just overall, I think I think it's Kyle Shanahan one, Jimmy Garoppolo two, and then we can get to you know blame down the line with wide receivers not separating but really to me that's like arizona has a good secondary and your third fourth and fifth receivers depend on the one and the two really to get them open and then once george kittle got hurt and was primarily a decoy they couldn't do anything yeah i I think it I, i agree with you that it definitely comes down to kyle shanahan first um you could put as much blame on jimmy as you want but you gotta understand he's only gonna be able to do so much if the play calling is bad um, he can make the best of a bad scenario, but for the most part, he's out there, you know, just you can't trust him at this point in his career. And that's unfortunate to say, but that's that's the, the ugly truth is he's not going to go out there. And, and maybe at times he was able to go out there and win the game for you. But right now he's not that guy, especially with the depleted roster. You know, I would put also put some blame on the front office, which you also have to include Kyle Shanahan in there because he makes a lot of the personnel decisions. Um, they knew going into this, like we said in the live recap, that they were going to be injured at wide receiver. They knew that, who they had available and who wasn't going to be available, and yet they still stood pat and did nothing. And then today they came out and uh, Pramat Mayoko said that he wouldn't rule out bringing in a guy like Mohamed Sanu and that he loves Sanu. Well, you should have loved Sanu on Saturday. You shouldn't have waited until your wide receivers did absolutely nothing to love Sanu now. He should have been enough then, and it should have made – enough sense then to sign him then because you put Jimmy out there with absolutely nobody to throw the ball to. I saw uh, per, I think pro football focus, Dante Pettis had like 0.87 yard separations per route ran or something like that. Some ridiculous number. It, it was horrible. It was a horrible product, but at the end of the day, the buck stops with Kyle Shanahan. Um, but I would have liked to have seen them make some moves on the personnel side to kind of counteract their injuries to Debo and Ayuk. <laughs> Uh, But unfortunately, they didn't do that, and we saw what the result of that was. Um, Now, maybe not so directly, Matt. Who else do you think the blame kind of shifts to? Right. Uh, Well, before I get to that, I want to push back a little bit on on Kyle Shanahan and and the 49ers not trusting Jimmy Garoppolo. Um, They threw the ball more than they passed the ball, despite nursing a lead for a lot of the game. So uh, to me, it's not 
the failure isn't in that they don't trust Jimmy Garoppolo the, as far as play calling goes. The, the failure comes in, what type of plays are you running given the personnel that you're missing and the personnel that you have on the field? And Shanahan came out and said something that was just baffling to me and just sounded completely like coach speak, that the wide receivers separated fine, but that they just weren't a big part of the game plan. And to me, that makes no sense. You're going to have weapons out there that you're going to actually not use? I, I don't understand. And then for him to say that, but then have the last – you know, a couple of plays, uh, the the pass that bounced off of Patrick Peterson's helmet was to Kendrick Bourne. The fourth down play in the red zone was to Trent Taylor. So you're telling me that they're not a big part of the game plan, but on two of the most crucial plays of the game, they're two wide receivers. Something to me that just doesn't add up there. So I'm, I'm not buying that one. Um, I'm also not buying that they don't trust Jimmy Garoppolo. Um, they did the best with what they had. You know, the, the backup center, Guasu, uh, I think his name was, he did pretty good, um, but there was pressure on Jimmy a lot of the time. He had to step up and climb pockets on that Bourne throw. He was a second late because uh, Zach Allen beat Mike McGlinchey around the edge, and Jimmy had to step up back up into the pocket before he could throw that. Um, I think that, you know, had some had some impact on where the throw went. And so that leads me into who I would also blame, and that is just – injuries um i think injuries played a huge part in the 49ers not being able to get rhythm um and and like you said you know personnel they could have brought muhammad sanu in shanahan talked about hey we're definitely you know going to take a look at him if he's available today but it's like you should have done that last week and you know we talked about it before debo samuel with the with the the summit to determine whether or not he was ready and it's like why are you waiting till the last minute you brought in J.J. Nelson. You brought in Tavon Austin. You brought in Kevin White. You brought in all this garbage, but you have a guy like Sanu who has been a producer, and people will say, oh, well, Bill Belichick cut him, and they only have Julian Edelman. Well, not everybody works with the Patriot system. The Patriot system is very unique. Bill Belichick is a very persnickety coach, and that's not necessarily an indictment on whatever Mohamed Sanu has left in the tank. So, you have to at least pick up the phone and give him a call and bring him in before you just write that off. So I, I don't buy that. But injuries have you know taken a toll. And fortunately, it looks like George Kittle avoided major injury. He has a knee sprain. It looks like from all indications that we're going to get Brandon Ayuk next week. Um, if they do sign Mohamed Sanu, that'll be another body out there that we can get. And hopefully that'll take pressure off of you know Kendrick Bourne, who's going to be a career third or fourth wide receiver. He works hard. I love his work ethic. He has some great catches, but he is what he is. He's never going to be more than that. And there's a reason why he was an undrafted guy. You know, there's a reason why Trent Taylor's a fifth round pick. The real disappointment is Dante Pettis, who I think alligator armed a fully catchable pass. He went into business for himself and, you know, made a business decision not to put his body on the line. And that's disappointing, but I think at this point we know that that Dante Pettis is never going to be a guy that we're going to rely on, and and all the hopes that we had before the game uh, were kind of dashed, you know, after the game. So going forward, I mean, you have to do the best that you can with injuries, and if Kyle Shanahan can clean up the play calling, um, Jimmy Garoppolo should have a better week next week. The Jets are horrendous. So it's going to be one of those things where you kind of like you can pick on your little brother a little bit and you can beat up your little brother a little bit to get back on track. And we'll see where we go from there. Um, you know, everything I saw, you know, before this game, you know, Pittsburgh and New York was on Monday Night Football and and New York looks terrible. I mean, Saquon Barkley can't run. They can't defend 85 year old Ben Roethlisberger with the gimpy arm and, you know, rusty legs. And and so. I'm not really worried about that either. So now you're looking at a situation where you come back home to play the Eagles on in, in a primetime game. And then at that point, you know, Shanahan said today, maybe Debo's back by week four, which is what I predicted. And if he can make it back by week four, um, you're going to start to see people like, you know, Ben Garland starting to get healthy. Um, and who knows, once you get a little bit of health and get the ball rolling and you have some momentum, things can turn around really quickly. Um, we talked about the Pittsburgh game, the home opener last week. It was sloppy. So one game does not make a season. I don't want people to overreact. Of course they are. We talk about it all the time. Don't overreact. It's just, you know, it's a game. Not everything is, you know, the end of the world. They're going to act like it is. But, you know, there's definite improvement that needs to be made. Yeah, and, you know, I just feel like, the fact that injuries and to clarify, I wasn't saying the Niners don't trust Jimmy Garoppolo. 
I'm saying I don't trust Jimmy Garoppolo, and maybe they trusted him a little too much with the product that was out there. Um, great quarterbacks are able to elevate the play of their receivers and their their surrounding uh, cast. I don't think he's at that point yet, so I think maybe they made a mistake trusting him a little too much, just to clarify. Um, but yeah, totally, injuries just made this team put out a poor performance yesterday, and it's not an excuse, but it's just looking at it from a factual standpoint. They didn't have Debo, they didn't have Ayuk, and who knows what the 49ers have in Ayuk, but we do know what we have in Debo, and Debo not only helps the passing game, he helps the running game. So there's two different factors of the offense that Debo is not sparking. He's not, you know, getting life into. So it's tough to overcome. And you, you're playing a team who you already played tough twice last season. And now you come in depleted, completely flat. Your defense is gassed because you're on, 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 the, on the field so much, played so mm -hmm. many snaps. I think I saw they played the most snaps going back to like 20. 78. Yeah. It's 78 snaps. So you can't win. That's not a winning formula. No matter how you draw it up, no matter right. how little you claim the, the receivers weren't in the game plan to begin with, it's not a winning formula. So it, well, it's just yes. it's too much. I agree. I agree. But if we're going to find a silver lining in there somewhere, all that being true, offense played like crap. You know, Kyle Shanahan wasn't calling plays right. Jimmy Garoppolo looked flustered. They didn't have wide receivers. They didn't have interior O-line. They couldn't run the ball. All this stuff but they were still in position to win the game at the end. So you're talking about a team that does have enough innate talent that, you know, even playing, this is probably going to be the worst game that they play all year. Uh, and well, I mean, hopefully, and if it is, you're talking about a team that was still right there with a chance to win an up and coming young Cardinals team that gave them fits last year. So I think if there's anything to take out of that, it's that. And and the offense will get better. It's just a matter of of, of timing. And this season is going to start out weird just because of COVID and the situation with that. No preseason games. We've seen a lot of slop football this weekend. Um, like I said on the recap show, the guys that really – had a handle on things and looked really good were the more athletic quarterbacks that rely more on athleticism than they do rhythm and scheme. So the scheme will catch up those, those type of players, the rhythm offenses, the scheme offenses will catch up. It's just a matter of finding your footing in, in a weird off season. Yeah. And, and you know, not only did we play this team tough last year, but they added the best receiver in the NFL and Deandre Hopkins the 49ers haven't addressed their secondary for seems like two to three years now. No wonder he's going to give them fits. No wonder it's going to be a lot to handle. Um, so yeah, man, it was just it was just a lot. And the 49ers came out flat. They didn't come out with the same energy that we're used to. And I mean, we saw what happened. So I think I agree with definitely agree with Matt. They're gonna come out next week with a lot more energy, a lot more intensity, and this is gonna be a game to get their confidence back up. As messed up as it sounds, but that's that's just true. They're going to beat up on the Jets, um, and we had predictions there on the uh, live recap yesterday. We'll go ahead and do another uh, preview at the end of this week. But if you yeah. guys are curious right now, go and check out the live video from yesterday. Will the real Eric Armstead and D Ford please stand up? Anthony, they had a not so great performance to say the least. Do you think that they'll step that up? And what do you think the reason for that was? Well, first and foremost, looking at D Ford coming into this game, he did not look like in good physical shape. I don't know if he added weight. I don't know if he added muscle because he looked he he looked like he could be cut off in between a, a, a interior defensive lineman and a defensive end. He looked very thick, and just his get off on snaps was so slow. This guy, I mean, he didn't look like anything he did last season when his get off was a lot faster. And you can't give me the excuse that oh he didn't have Buckner, so that didn't help him improve his own pass rush. I don't care who's next to you. You have to just go out there and ball. And we didn't see the D Ford that we did last season when he was healthy and i i'm very concerned about that and i get it it's the off season he didn't get any preseason games quote unquote he only had training camp he had to shake off a lot of the rust but again you're being paid all this money to be one of the premier pass rushes on our team and to get 55 percent of snaps and have almost no impact on the game that that kind of hits home to me so to say that he's gonna show up to the next game i don't think so guys i really don't think so as for eric armstead though i think 
think Eric Armstead has a better shot of improving his own game. He he had a little bit of pressure here and there. He was kind of penetrating, but he just wasn't hitting home. And I don't mean hitting home as in getting to Kyler Murray and sacking him. I mean hitting home as in beating his blocks. We didn't see him do that all that often yesterday. He had his flashes and he has moments, and that's Matt's favorite where he's flashing. But overall, he didn't put it all together. And more, and more often than not, he was very ineffective. And I liked what I saw from Kerry Hyder. I liked what I saw from Kinlaw. But – I should be saying I liked what I saw from D. Ford and Eric Armstead, not they were complete non-factors in this game. So in my opinion, I think Armstead has a better shot of improving his game over D. Ford because I don't know if it's just D. Ford doesn't have confidence in that knee. I don't know if he just doesn't have confidence in his game at the moment. Maybe he is rusty. Maybe he's still hurt. We don't know. This team is very transparent when it comes to injuries. And we saw what they did last season. They managed D. Ford snaps. And again, they did that this past. And you got people like David Lombardi saying, oh, well, that is a big improvement over last season. Well, yeah, but this guy's had an entire offseason of recovery, and he's at training camp where he's been saying, I feel good, I feel great, I'm ready to go out there. Where was he? Well, he did not show up to the game. And, a again, I don't think he has as good of a shot as Eric Armstead to show up next week. Yeah, it was unfortunate because this defensive line looked completely different than they did in last season. And I understand they, that they had trouble containing mobile quarterbacks going back to last year, but I would hope that they would have made a little bit of adjustment or an improvement this season, knowing that's their biggest area of weakness. I mean, looking back to the Super Bowl, those Mayhome scrambles, that was their kryptonite. I mean, being able to extend plays, and obviously we could talk about holding all day long, but Part of it also is even Lamar Jackson, uh, twice with Kyler Murray, twice with Russell Wilson. No matter what they do, I mean, even Jared Goff made them look silly with those boot rollouts. So it's like, come on, man! I was hoping that they would have done a little more. And D Ford, yeah, he he looked he looked thick. That's what he looked. He looked thick with two C's. And I was like, what is up with this guy? Because he's out here talking just like you said. He's out here talking like he's improved. He's ready to go. He's healthy. The 49ers restructured his contract. And then he kind of goes out there and lays an egg. And, um, you know, all this talk about Eric Garmstead, on the other hand, is, you know, no, it wasn't just a ball out for a contract year. This is who he actually is. He's finally, you know, feels comfortable playing his own position in, in his own shoes in the NFL. This is him to stay. And he didn't really do much either. So I don't know. I was kind of, you know, disappointed in what we saw from the outing from both of them. Matt, is, th is that right to be disappointed? Or do you think that there was more there that they played well and it shouldn't really show up? No, they didn't play well. Um, the only guy that really popped off the tape to me was Nick Bosa, who got pressure early. And then when they figured out nobody else was doing anything, they were able to shift uh, more protection over to Bosa's side and kind of take him out of the game. Uh, really, the issue for me, um, and I'm going to push back a little bit on D Ford. Um, I know that he had the offseason surgery and he did come in a little thick. He also had that, you know, that weird thing they were talking about, like a calf Achilles tweak kind of thing. And so I think that might be playing a part in the whole get off thing um and it's just going to be a matter of him working himself into shape uh which is unfortunate when you have lower body injuries it really limits what you can do as far as eric armstead um i don't like to see and i realize they have to do it because they have so many guys but i don't like to see solomon thomas and you know carry Hyder jr and stuff rotating to the inside while pushing Armstead out to the edge. I don't think that Armstead is good on the end. I think he needs to play inside. He's not fast enough, and he doesn't have enough bend to, to really affect the edge the way that some of the other guys can. Um, with D Ford off his game, you're kind of limited, and I really do think that D Ford being limited in that regard and Eric Armstead not being effective on the end is why they're going to take a look at Ziggy Ansa again um, because they need another guy that can set the edge. Um, Zach, to your point of them not being able to stop Mahomes and Murray, that to me is less about the defensive line and the players on the defensive line as it is about scheme, where the 49ers are running a cover three with a four-man rush. They're dropping guys back into coverage, and then they're, you're allowing essentially these athletes to work in space. And once they're in space, they can make guys miss because you know sometimes zone integrity is not the strong suit of these 49ers linebackers and the, the defensive backs. We've seen it with, you know, Quan Alexander, where he lost track of the line of scrimmage and got completely turned around on a Kyler Murray scramble on third and 17. You know, there are issues with their zone integrity and some of their awareness in open space. So to me, it's less about 
uh, you know, the the line with because when you're rushing four, your job is to pin your ears back and get after the quarterback and collapse the pocket. If the quarterback escapes up through the pocket, now it's on your back seven to take care of that because you're out of position. So to me, it's less about the the defensive line itself and more about um, you know, the scheme that they're running and and Robert Hall is going to have to really tweak that. Um, but we need D Ford to get into shape stay healthy and justify the 80 plus million dollars that we're paying him. And we need Eric Armstead to play up to what he did last year to earn himself a contract. Um, you know, it, it, people saying, Oh, we should have kept DeForest Buckner. That was never in the cards. DeForest Buckner is now the second highest paid defensive tackle in the NFL behind Aaron Donald. It, it wasn't going to happen. There wasn't enough cap space for us to do that and sign anybody of note we couldn't have re-upped George Kittle with that type of commitment. It just wouldn't have worked based on the salary cap. And I know the salary cap's kind of funky and, you know, Kansas City's been able to manipulate the hell out of it and so has the Rams. But in terms of we got guys coming up that we need to take care of, um, you know, so to me, they need to play up to their contract or, you know, they need to get gone. It's plain and simple. Yeah, it's unfortunate because I was hearing that all day yesterday, too, after the game. They should have kept Buckner. They should have kept Buckner. And, yeah, it wasn't an option for the 49ers. The writing was on the wall. They had not – they didn't have that money, excuse me, to pay him. So right. they, 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 they did the best be, they could do, and Armstead was the best. Let's be clear, too. They played all those rushing team, all those rushing quarterbacks last year with Buckner – and they still yep. gave up contain. So it's not like Buckner would have made a huge difference. So the people calling for Buckner, they're just saying things. It's the same people who are like, it's Nick Mullins season because Jimmy Garoppolo, you know, missed a couple of passes or whatever. It's it's going to happen, you know. Like, beat, players have bad games. This was a bad game for the team all the way around front to back. So nobody was really on point except for, again, except for maybe like Nick Bosa and, and Fred Warner. You know, but those guys are always there. So going forward, if they clean it up, it's going to look a lot better, especially against teams like the Jets and the Giants. Yeah, and, and that's going to be my next question, Anthony, is what do you want to see them, both of the, these guys, do next week against the Jets to show that it wasn't a fluke and that they actually are – they did, excuse me, come to play this year? According to PF, PFF, Eric Armstead and D Ford combined for three hurries. I don't want to see two guys combine to make over $100 million get three hurries in an entire game when you're already playing a very atrocious offensive line in the Arizona Cardinals. And don't get me wrong, you watch the game, those guys, the entire unit on the defensive line was getting pressure throughout the day. But to see guys like Bosa stand out, okay, that makes sense. But when I see more contribution from Solomon Thomas, Kerry Hyder, DJ Jones, and Javon Kinlaw, and that's no disrespect to them, it's just – we should be highlighting D Ford and Eric Armstead, not those guys in particular. And I think it's great that we're highlighting them, but I don't think it's great that we have to have these kind of conversations about two guys who are eating up more than 15 to 20% of our salary cap, when quite frankly, salary cap is already going to be tight next season as it is, and we're going to need to roll over as much money as possible. So going to the Jets game, I do expect a better game in which we do face a more natural pocket passer in Sam Darnold, who already has another questionable offensive line as it is. And they shouldn't come into this game just like this game thinking, oh, we got this. This game's in the bag. It's nothing. Because quite frankly, we saw all that swagger from those guys in the first quarter. And then when the offense wasn't moving and the defense had to get out there too much, we saw that excitement and that energy kind of slowly dwindle as they're going, oh, man, we got to get out in this field. And yeah, they're already in smoky condition, so it's hard enough as it is. But when you have terrible offensive efficiency like that, you got to go out there and make up for it. And they had games last season where Garoppolo may not have been at his best and the defense did show up. I'm not crediting that to just Buckner like Matt's saying. Buckner in this game would have made a difference. The entire defense is what makes a difference. And we didn't really see that after the first quarter for the rest of the game. So going into this Jets game, you guys, I want to see them get after and get, get home against Sam Darnold. I want to see D Ford's get off improve because quite frankly, he had one of the fastest snap to uh, snap to go times in all the NFL because he has a fantastic first step off the line. 
Eric Armstead may not be that kind of pass rusher, but when he does shed blocks, he is efficient at hurrying the quarterback, and he can be that kind of guy, even without Buckner. So going into this game, I just want to see more energy from them. I want to see more consistency because that was the biggest problem yesterday was inconsistency, and I don't want to see that from my 100 plus million dollar duo. I want I and I may not want to see sacks from these guys, but I want to see pressure. I want to see them getting home so they can open up sacks for guys like Bosa and eventually Kerry Hyder and Jones and so on and so forth. So Zach, Matt, these guys need to hit home. I want to see a better first step and I just need to see more consistent energy from these guys because after the first quarter, it felt very lackadaisical. Yeah, yeah it I want from... to see them I want to see them haunt that fucking house. That's that's what they need to do. Haunt that house. Make Sam Darnold see all the ghosts that he can handle. So uh, move Eric Armstead back inside because what he does well is collapse that interior line and push the pocket into the quarterback. Sam Darnold's not mobile. You push the pocket into the quarterback, and then you're going to set the table for people like Nick Bosa and D Ford and you know the edge rushers that they have. So I want to comment on that early, real quick too. Yeah, early and often, that. just get in Darnold's yeah. face, make him see ghosts. Solomon Thomas on the inside, Javon Killa, DJ Jones, and even Kevin Givens all were doing their job. They should have had open opportunities, D Ford and Armstead, I mean. And I get it. It's a rotation, so they're not going to all be what Buckner was. But there shouldn't have been any excuse for D Ford and Eric Armstead to have the games they did yesterday. No excuse. I'm not going to use Rust as an excuse. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to use the offseason injury as an excuse. These guys had all training camp to get healthy and get ready. And they had all, all offseason to brag about how well they're going to play. And we didn't see that. There should be no excuses going into this week. Yeah, it, you know, it went real quick, touch on your point, Anthony, from dancing in the first quarter and hyped up to hands on your hips out of breath, and it was it was evident in their performance. We are concerned about Manuel Mosley going forward. Matt, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Uh, yes, and I know that people are going to say, well, it's DeAndre Hopkins. He's like the best receiver in football. Yeah, but he still torched you for 11 receptions on 12 targets or whatever against Emmanuel Mosley, gave up the most amount of yards. It seemed like every time they needed a conversion, Emmanuel Mosley was on DeAndre Hopkins, and it was DeAndre Hopkins catching a pass in Emmanuel Mosley's face and, it, you know, getting first downs. So to me, it's just, you know, again, this is one of those things that we talk about when we talked about the wide receivers. There's a reason why a guy like Emmanuel Mosley was an undrafted free agent, and we saw a lot of good things from him last year, but now you have teams that have tape on you. They know your tendencies. They know your strengths. They know your weaknesses. They're going to play to your weaknesses, and especially a guy like Hopkins, who is among the best in the business. Um, I know that Sherman traveled a little bit more than he usually does, but if it was me, I would have put Sherman on him all day just to make sure, you know, and then let the veteran decide how to get it done because it's not like Hopkins was really beating them over the top. Um, his one really long reception came on a complete bust in coverage where Richard Sermon said that both sides of the defense, you know, they couldn't hear each other, so they were running different coverages. So they left a wide open hole, and, you know, he ended up getting that long reception that was almost a touchdown. So to me, corner was one of the positions that I thought they should have addressed to begin with. I hammered home that they should have gone after Logan Ryan in free agency and brought somebody in because Sherman's aging. Because you don't know exactly what you have in Mosley. Because Akella Witherspoon is inconsistent. I mean, could you imagine if it was Witherspoon out there instead of Mosley? I mean, I can't imagine it could have gone much worse other than the fact that Akella Witherspoon seems to give up touchdowns left and right. So at least there's that. But, you know, corner is a weakness for this team. And they're going to exploit it. Safety, not a weakness. You know, Ward had pass deflections. Tart had an interception on a tip drill. The safeties come up and they ball out. But if you can't contain somebody like Hopkins, who really you had to worry about two players, you know, you had to worry about Kyler Murray and you had to worry about DeAndre Hopkins. And somehow they both just ate you up. Other than Hopkins receptions, though, none of the other receivers for the Cardinals did anything. You know, even with Hopkins production, Kyler Murray averaged 5.75 yards per attempt, which is terrible. So it was essentially Emmanuel Mosley getting eaten up all day long. That was the difference in the passing game for the Cardinals. So going forward, yes, I am worried because he's, I mean, even though, again, it's one of the best receivers in football, it's a really bad look. And to get, you know, get your start in the season on that down a level, I don't know that that bodes well for his confidence. You know, I am I will re disagree with you a little bit. Um, I when, when we posed this question, my mind did go to, 
it is DeAndre Hopkins. So I would be the fools that you're talking about, but it's like, you know what you have in Emmanuel Mosley. And just like you said, that just shows that why he, you know, came into the league the way that he did. And, you know, he wasn't a highly coveted draft pick. He wasn't a first round selection. No, not at all. So I just feel like the 49ers may have put him, hang him out to dry on Sunday because it's like, what else do you expect? You put him out there against a hot, top caliber receiver. He's going to get burned. He's going to get burned nine yeah, times out of I, ten. Yeah, but I expect them to put good corners on the field when they have the opportunity in the offseason to sign one like Logan Ryan because Logan Ryan wouldn't have given up 11 receptions to DeAndre no, Hopkins. I, totally agree. Totally agree. But then, then your issues with the front office, not with Mosley. Um, he's doing, but the that doesn't that mean, can. but that doesn't mean that doesn't mitigate my worry about Mosley going forward because he's been exposed and now other teams know how to attack him. And you only have one Richard Sherman on one side. And if they're not going to attack Richard Sherman, they're going to go after the other guy. And who do you have behind him? Oft injured Jason Verrett, who was out because he was injured again. And you have Akella Witherspoon, who is one stiff breeze away from going and getting boo boo face over on the sideline because he gave up another goddamn touchdown. So I am worried about Mosley because he's been exposed. Well, with that being said, not every team has a DeAndre Hopkins, and he's played relatively well against average receivers and slightly even maybe even above average receivers. So just to push back on that, not every team has a guy like DeAndre Hopkins. So no. I, I, I'm concerned, but I just think we know what we have in him, and right. the 49ers should have done something in the offseason or, like you said, put Sherman on him and made him follow – DeAndre Hopkins. Right. But who are, they didn't who, do are that. The best, who are the best teams in the AFC? Let's just say we get back to the Super Bowl. Who are the two best teams in the AFC? Baltimore the Chiefs and Kansas City. And the Ravens. And what do they both have? Outstanding wide receiving course that are going to eat up people like Mosley. You might get something. I mean, you're not going to put Richard Sherman on Tyreek Hill or Hollywood Brown. So who, who does that go to? That goes to Mosley. And now he's exposed and he's going to get chewed up. So if you're talking about this team potentially vying for a Super Bowl and getting back to a Super Bowl and winning one, then you have to worry about Mosley because once you get, I mean, you can make it through the regular season and you can feast on crappy teams like the Jets and the Giants. But if you want to be a real contender, you have to be able to stand up to the top tippy top teams in the league. And to me, Mosley, I don't know if he's going to be able to do it. What do you think, Anthony? So pulling out my handy dandy PFF, Richard Sherman was targeted twice. He only allowed one catch on nine yards, and I'm almost positive that other that catch was DeAndre Hopkins. As for Emmanuel Mosley, he was attacked all day long. 13 targets, nine receptions. He gave up 82 yards. So if you look, if you look deep into it, his overall totals weren't bad. To give up 82 yards, I mean, it, with the, that kind of Cardinals offense, I'll take it. Albeit a lot of that was against DeAndre Hopkins. And you can tell Cliff Kingsbury knew that Emmanuel Mosley was the weakness. So in a sense, I will agree with Matt. I do think that when you can expose that kind of weakness and yeah, he didn't give up hundred plus yards. He didn't give up any big plays. He kept everything right. in front of him against DeAndre Hopkins. But the big problem with that is I think Emmanuel Mosley has the talent to, to be that kind of enforcer. But when you realize that DeAndre Hopkins is catching everything in front of, in front of him and making a play afterwards, you got to make some kind of adjustment, man. And other teams are going to see that. Like Matt said, they had all kinds of film on Emmanuel Mosley after last season. And maybe this was a good example of what film can do for you. Everything was in front of Emmanuel Mosley. And I think Salah was trying to hide that. I think he was trying to hide the fact that he doesn't want Hopkins to take everything over the top against Mosley mm -hmm. because Mosley can give up the big plays like he did against Kansas City. And that leads to the point that can he go up against the tippy top of wide receivers? He didn't do it last year. I get he's a rookie. I get that he's undrafted. I get that he didn't go up against that kind of talent. But when you see that that is the weakness, I think that leads to concern for me too, because you saw Richard Sherman. He did everything he was supposed to do. He gave up one catch. And PFF can be kind of ticky-tack depending on how you look at it. But the big picture is that, on, is that Sherman yeah. did his job. Emmanuel Mosley did everything he could. But at some point, you got to see, hey, Mosley – Hawkins is catching everything underneath, undercut something, mm -hmm. make some kind of adjustment to where you can go and attack that ball. You, as, your, as a cornerback, you got to trust that your safety is going to be back there to make a play. And yeah, maybe mostly in the defense was playing it safe, but when you see that the team is just going after you all day long and the offense isn't doing anything, no one's getting mm -hmm. pressure, no one's forcing turnovers, sometimes you have to get risky and go out there and make a play. And quite frankly, Emmanuel mostly didn't do that. Do I think he can be that corner? Eh, I don't think so. But when you have a team attacking you, you have to make some kind of adjustment. And quite frankly, mm -hmm. I don't know if he can make that adjustment going forward. 
Yeah, I, I would be very curious to see who PFF uh, attributed that busted coverage to that, uh, you know, accounted for a bunch of yards. I know it was I, I don't know if they specified, uh, but it seems to me like, you know, there was a lot of couple building to go around. So, I mean, yeah, right now, outside of Richard Sherman and K1 Williams, who remains one of the better slot safeties in the NFL, uh, you know, they're really thin at corner and they missed an opportunity to go get some talent. And I think it's going to bite them going forward. Either it's going to be, you know, a trial by fire for Mosley. And if he can't do it, then we're not left with many alternatives. You know, just, just closing it out here. We heard going back to last year that they don't need top tier corners because they have a top tier defensive line. They have elite pass rushers. They have elite linebackers. Well, Sunday was exhibit A of what happens when your defensive line, did I say offensive line, excuse me, defensive line, when your defensive line isn't at their peak and they're not playing as well as they should have, mm -hmm. then your corners get exposed, your secondary gets exposed, and you're stuck, sitting there scratching your head like, dang, maybe we should have addressed our secondary because we just didn't. And now they're, you know, DeAndre Hopkins made, made us look like fools. What the 49ers need to do to pull out a win in week two against New York Jets. Uh, Matt, take it away. What do they need to do? They need to remember that they're the defending NFC champions. Um, they need to clean up the mistakes. They need to come out and punch New York in the mouth. They need to make Sam Darnold see all the ghosts that he can handle. I mean, I mean, we're talking about right in the middle of Ghostbusters type ghosts. You know what I mean? And make them make mistakes. Adam Gase is a trash coach. They're a trash team. New York sucks. And don't play down to your competition. Go in there. Get an easy win, and then go and kick back in Virginia until next week when you got to play the Giants. It's it's that simple. Get Jimmy on schedule. Get you know dial up plays that that are going to maximize the talent that's out there. Try to incorporate Brandon Ayuk, provided that he plays. Protect George Kittle from himself because he's going to want to play. You don't necessarily need George Kittle for for the Jets. Um, you know, try to get out of there with your health and really just play a clean football game. And it should be a, an easy two, three touchdown victory. Yeah, that, that's a big one is resting George Kittle because, you know, they came out today saying that, you know, he had a, I believe it was a hamstring sprain or knee sprain. And, uh, you know, that they're going to reevaluate on Wednesday and we'll see if he plays. It's like, just sit him. Why risk further injuring him when you could probably win this game without him? Um, but yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that they need to remember who they are. Remember what got them to the ship last year and what almost won them the, the championship last year. And that's a strong running game, play action passing, smart play calling, and a stout defense. And we didn't see any of that week one. Um, Anthony, what do you think that they need to do to leave New York with a win? Based on PFF, the New York Jets' offensive line gave up 21 pressures. 21. I'm not counting sacks or anything, just alone, 21 pressures. The Bills feature a pretty good defensive line. So I think we feature, we still have a top five defensive line, in my opinion. Even with D. Ford and Eric Armstead having an off game, these guys still have all the talent in the world to make the difference, obviously led by Nick Bosa. So in this game, we got to see that pass rush hit home, man. Whether the offense was bad or good, that's an eye of the beholder. The defense last season was the key. The defensive line was literally the lock and key. That was the, that was the complete aspect of the entire team last season, more so than the offense making plays, more so than the defense forcing turnovers. The defensive line was the moneymaker. If you have an offensive line in New York giving up 21 pressures to a slightly above average defensive line, in my opinion, these guys have to hit home. Eric Armstead, D Ford, they need to step up. Nick Bosa hit home. He was doing it. He was doing it yesterday. He just didn't get the sack. He was doing everything he could. Everyone on that defensive line needs to contribute because, quite frankly, Sam Darnold is going to be seeing ghosts out there. That's Matt's favorite reference of the week, but he's going to do it. This defense has proved that, based on yesterday, they have the potential to go out there and make plays. We saw it happen. We saw them flash. We got to see them put it all together. And based on this defense, it starts with the defensive line. Got to get sacks. Got to get pressures consistently. There's no excuse going to this week. Sam Darnold isn't Kyler Murray. Sam Darnold isn't anything spectacular, in my opinion. No excuses. Go out there, hit home, get sacks, come away with a W. Yeah, I think that's the biggest point, too. Sam Darnold is not Kyler Murray. So when Nick Bosa gets pressure, it's going to be a sack. Um, there's not going to be those escapes that Kyler Murray has where, I mean, he's five foot nothing, a hundred and nothing, and just can, you know, slip and find his way through you know, everybody's grasp. I mean, it took 
I think it was Kerry Hyder took a stretching that T-shirt to its limit to bring him down. So, yeah, I mean, listen, the Jets do not have a lot of talent. Le'Veon Bell looks like he doesn't even care about football anymore. He hasn't done anything since getting that He's contract. out for the week, too. He's also out. Okay, so he's out. So, I mean, you know, I, I'm almost more worried that he's out than if he was playing because he hasn't done anything. They have no wide receivers. I mean, I'm not scared by anything that the Jets represent offensively. And defensively, if you can just keep, you know, they have a pretty decent interior defensive line. If you can keep them from clogging up the middle, you should be able to run down their throat all day. There's no Jamal Adams back there. Um, you know, CJ Mosley still looks a step slow after returning from injury. So it's there all day for the 49ers to take advantage of. It's going to be some clean, fresh air. Take a big, deep breath, boys. Fill your lungs with that nice, cool New York air and just get after it, man. Yeah, that, that's going to be huge getting in there and getting some clean air because they get two weeks away from this filthy California air due to all these fires. And they, they should be able to capitalize on both weeks. But focusing on the Jets alone, um, yeah, Le'Veon Bell's out. So that means the OG Frank Gore will be back there uh, running oh up the middle. <laughs> and, you know, unfortunately for, for Grandpa Frank, I don't think that his team's going to come out victorious this time. Something tells me he won't have oh. too much of an issue with it. Um, but what I really, really want to see is them improve on time of possession. Get back to those long drives where you're running the ball, just, you know, being that powerhouse team. And Raheem Moster, I want to see him have, you know, 100-plus yards. I want to see Jarek McKinnon have at least 80 yards on the ground. You know, I want to really see this team get back to the basics because last week it was like an unfamiliar team. I don't even know who mm -hmm. they were out there on the field. And I want to see them get back to who they are as a football team, as a heart and soul. And then maybe they can go into week three and week four building on that foundation yep. that they should have set in week one, but it took till week two to build. And now they're getting, getting some confidence. Um, now, Matt, let me go back to you real quick. Is this a yeah. get right game for everyone? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um, even for Kyle Shanahan, who, again, we talked about earlier, had some weird play calls, man. Um, those He was running sweet plays out of shotgun that just did not work. Uh, they weren't lined up to Mostert's skill set. And I think that goes to missing players and, and missing personnel and Shanahan trying to get cute with the scheme. But he really needs to stick with what works. You know, uh, Guasu, the center, the, uh, you know, he didn't give up a pressure at all. So, I mean, like I said, um, it, you know, I think in our group chat or whatever, backup offensive linemen typically do an okay job at run blocking pass pro is really where they're going to struggle and really where you're going to see it so just go out there and punch the jets in the mouth run the football down their throat control time of possession get jimmy in a rhythm where you can with play action passing and you know passes between the numbers and you're going to go out there and you're going to put up 31 points against a terrible Jets team, 38 points. You know, I, I foresee this to be a blowout. And after that, all the the letdown of week one, you know, it, all the stink of, of that Santa Clara fire air is going to be gone. And they're going to get back to business and remember why they are the NFC champions and, and get rid of that potential Super Bowl hangover. And then all the people that are bashing them this week on Twitter – will keep their mouth shut or go attack Cowboys fans or something, you know, with their time, whatever they want to do and not overreact to whatever it's, I mean, they're going to overreact the other way. It's going to be like, we're the best ever. And you know, so, but yeah, it's a get right game for them. I fully expect them to come out and, and take it to the jets and, and, and hand them their lunch. I mean, easily. All right, guys, I think that's going to do it for us today. Um, and we will be doing a preview video before the game, so look out for that this uh, upcoming weekend. But I want to thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Niners News here on 49ers Hive. If you like what you see, show support, hit that subscribe button, and also hit that like button and drop a comment below. Uh, what do you think the 49ers need to do to leave New York with a win? Go ahead and click the bell for notifications. We're dropping videos, and you don't want to miss a thing. So until we see you next time, Go Niners.